every tree within a 500 yard radius of where you would stand had bullet riddled trees. He said, in conclusion, there is no place just like this on the continent. Well, this morning we're standing here at one of the really special places on the Gaines's Mill battlefield. Uh, this body of woods that's on all four sides of me and all four sides of the camera has been called for the last few years Griffin's Woods, which is a modern name to help give it some identity. I think when the battle took place here in June of 1862, this body of woods didn't really have a name, uh, but we call it Griffin's Woods now because General Charles Griffin's Federal Brigade began the battle here. This woods historically was about 75 acres uh, contiguous, and the trust has already purchased a little bit of it in the corners and now has the chance to sew up about half of that 75 acres in one fell swoop. And it's a good thing that battlefields are not judged on their physical beauty because Griffin's Woods would score pretty low. Uh, it's unsightly, densely wooded, almost no landmarks, uh, could be standing anywhere in the country except for the historical significance of what happened here. And we evaluate battlefields on the significance and on the integrity of the ground. And in both of those regards, Griffin's Woods scores very, very high. On June the 27th of 1862, the second of the Seven Days Battles, Army Commander, Federal Army Commander George McClellan had deployed his fifth corps under his trusted subordinate, Fitz John Porter, as a rear guard, a sort of a speed bump in the path of the concentrating Army of Northern Virginia under Robert E. Lee. McClellan had determined to evacuate the outskirts of Richmond, reposition his army to the south on the James River to buy time for that, all the logistics that went into it. He left behind the Fifth Corps here on the north side of the Chickahominy River, 27, 30,000 men approximately, confronting about 60,000 Confederates from the Army of Northern Virginia. The far eastern end of the battlefield, the camera here is facing east or northeast, so off to the right front of the camera, probably a mile to the east, the Union right had long open approaches that could be defended easily, good lines of sight. The Union left behind the camera to the west, uh, the defenders there enjoyed a steeply wooded slope and wide open approaches beyond the slope, giving them ample opportunity to shoot up the Confederate attackers. We are in the center of the battlefield, in Griffin's Woods, and the woods tur turned out to be an ally to the Union defenders. Brigade after brigade of Confederates charged into these woods from the north to the left of the camera and found their strength frittered away as they tiptoed around briar patches and picked their way across streams and over felled trees, and it really did help to neutralize the manpower disparity at the Battle of Gaines's Mill. By my count, this 75-acre woodlot saw fighting from parts of 16 different brigades in the five and a half hour Battle of Gaines's Mill. Eight Union brigades, or parts of eight Union brigades, and parts of eight Confederate brigades. And to illustrate the point about the woods um, assisting the Union defense, the largest brigade in Robert E. Lee's army on June the 27th, Alexander Lawton's All-Georgia Brigade, six regiments, 3,500 men, most of them armed with Enfield rifles, so they had great firepower and size. They entered the north edge of Griffin's Woods, aiming toward Bosun's Creek, the south branch of which is right here over my shoulder, aiming for the federal line of defense, which was just to the right of the camera on a high hill. And within 15 minutes, Lawton's six regiments had broken into four physically unconnected pieces, some of which wound up a mile away after getting lost here in Griffin's Woods. So the woods were a great enemy of formations and strength and cohesiveness and organization. Where we are standing is a little flat shelf along the creek, but there is a steep slope to my right, the left of the camera, to the north, and that was the Confederate ridge ultimately. And to the right of the camera, to the south, is an even taller ridge defended by a series of Union regiments 
Um, the 3rd Pennsylvania Reserves of George Meade's Brigade, the 4th New Jersey was in there, the 11th Pennsylvania Reserves. Uh, those three regiments, just those three that I named, among the men of those three regiments, they probably fired more than 100,000 rounds of small arms directly over my head in the course of the firefight that took place here uh, toward twilight on June the 27th, just from those three regiments. These woods, although they were dense and full of thickets and thorns and briars and brush, they also had many tall oak trees mixed in. And before the battle began, federal soldiers toppled many of those oak trees right across where I'm standing with their tips, their branches, their tops pointing toward the creek, a further impediment to Confederate attackers. And that created some unusual scenes when the Confederates finally did get to the creek bottom and surged across where we are standing, most notably the flag bearer of the 1st Texas Infantry of John Bell Hood's Texas Brigade, some of which was in these woods. The flag bearer thought he couldn't get his colors through the obstructions, and so he took them, threw them like a javelin through the air over the obstructions. They landed on the ground. He got down on his hands and knees and crawled through the obstructions and rescued his flag on the other side. The most famous casualty in the entire battle of Gaines's Mill fell right in this vicinity as well, and that would be not a general, there were no generals killed at Gaines's Mill, but rather uh, Major Rob Wheat of the Louisiana Tigers, famous soldier of fortune, kind of a land pirate, large, bluff, hearty man, and here at Gaines's Mill, the Louisiana Brigade, not commanded by Wheat, commanded by someone else, uh, had its worst day of the war crossed the creek right where we're standing, took severe small arms fire, and panicked and fled back across the stream. And Major Wheat was so appalled by the performance, he refused to retreat and uh, was somewhere here within sight of where the camera is, is today uh, when he was shot dead on the ground. He supposedly said, bury me on the field, boys, his famous last words. And the following week, his sister came uh, to retrieve his remains, found that his famous last words and respected them, and so she left him where he was here on this ground and erected a granite monument to him um, as his grave, the first monument on the Gaines's Mill battlefield, July of 1862. Unfortunately, souvenir hunters chipped it away, and Wheat's sister grew angry at that and eventually dug him up and moved him to Hollywood Cemetery. But the most famous fatality of the Battle of Gaines's Mill happened right here in these woods as well. One of the most notable professional journalists in the South. Felix de Fontaine toured the entire battlefield the week afterwards, and he singled out these woods for special attention. He called it a pestilential position. I don't know if he was thinking of it from the Confederate point of view or the Union point of view, but he concluded his description of these woods by saying that you could not walk for 500 yards in any direction without finding uh, a, a and still find any tree that did not bear the marks of a bullet. Every tree within a 500 yard radius of where you would stand had bullet riddled trees. He said, in conclusion, there is no place just like this on the continent. Over the years, the trust has accomplished uh, miracles in protecting the Glendale or Fraser's Farm battlefield, the, the next to last of the seven days battles, and Malvern Hill, the last of the seven days battles, and more recently, uh, some of the less lesser known sites in that same vicinity, like First and Second Deep Bottom. And uh, I know uh, the current project for an 11 acre parcel over there actually falls within the footprint of all three of those battlefields that I mentioned. It, uh, it's on the edge of Glendale or Fraser's Farm, and it's on the uh, backside of Malvern Hill Battlefield, most germane really for First Deep Bottom in July of 1864. And at First Deep Bottom on July 28, of 1864, an entire division of Federal Cavalry, David Gregg's division, uh, was deployed on foot in the Long Bridge Road facing north and were struck by a, a battle group, an attack force cobbled together of Confederate infantry, and that produced the Battle of uh, First Deep Bottom on the 28th, also called the Battle of Gravelly Hill or the Battle of Enrufty Farm. So this property uh, is most germane for, for that being adjacent to Gregg's line in the Long Bridge Road.